thank you everyone for joining us today for our NVC online service. So whether you're watching at your couch or at the beach or somewhere in California or throughout the United States, we trust that you have a great time with us today, worshiping the Lord, spending time in the Word and fellowshipping online. So stay tuned for a great event and a great service. God bless you guys. between us by your cross you came and broke them down you broke them down and there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. Oh, back to life. All awaking, all creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Welcome, everybody, and thank you once again for joining us today for our NVC online service. As always, we want to stay connected with you during these times. We want to provide encouragement. We want to provide resources. We want to provide opportunities to connect during this time. So there's a couple ways that you can do that. You can text GROW at NVC to 97000, or you can fill out the digital connect card that's right there below. Either way, we want to stay in touch and just be a part of your life during these times and just encourage you along the way as well. And speaking of being encouraged, we are now meeting Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. at Kit Carson Park in Escondido at the El Arroyo Park picnic area number one each Sunday evening at 6 p.m. for worship, uh, for fellowship. Uh, the, the games start at 5 o'clock, so if you want to come early moving forward, come 5 o'clock, bring a picnic blanket, bring chairs, bring food and snacks, and just join us. We're going to have a great time, and we hope to see you there. Also, our church is coming along. Our building now has chairs in it, 
and it looks amazing. It's so exciting to see what God is doing here at NVC as we continue with our online broadcast and we continue to grow and make new members and friends throughout San Diego and throughout the United States, frankly. We thank you for tuning in and we will continue to do that, but we also now have opportunities to connect live at the park and we're excited about that. And of course, hopefully soon in the building itself. So great things are happening. Another example of what God is doing here, our children's ministry is preparing to have their place filled with young kids learning about Jesus. I know for me guys, growing up in the church, it was always a blessing to go to Sunday school, to go to the children's ministry and learn how to fall in love with Jesus, to learn the simple truths that Jesus loved me, to learn about the Bible, to learn about biblical principles has shaped my life. And all of us get an opportunity now to participate. I wanna announce and let you guys know that we are having an MVC Kids House warming event. So basically a chance for all of us to participate and fill that place with the needs that we need for our children's ministry. So go to our website, for more information, we've created a registry to make it simple for you, but we would love your help. We would love your help in filling that place with resources and tools and equipment and all the things necessary to provide a safe and healthy place for our children to learn and to grow in the love and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So go to our website. Uh, you can be prompted from there to be part of the NVC Kids House warming event it is going to be great we're going to focus on that this month and none of this is possible you guys none of this is possible without your support the church coming along uh, the children's ministry that's going to be booming pretty soon the fact that we can gather in the park as well and once again we thank you for your support we thank you for your generosity we thank you for your faithfulness to god's word and we've made it simple for you guys to continue to support us you can go online and set that up. You can be prompted right there on the screen. It'll walk you through it or just go to our website. You can also text amount that you want to give to 84321. Just text that amount to 84321 and you can give via text as well. And as always, you can give your donation or your gift. You can mail it to the address that's provided below. Either way, we thank you, we appreciate it, and we hope that you're excited about what God is doing here, and we thank you for being a huge, huge part of it. We hope to see you at one of our live events if you're ready. If not, rest assured, we will continue to provide the great online service and experience, but also providing opportunities for those that want to meet live. God bless you guys, and enjoy the rest of the service.
Welcome again to our 40 Days Through the New Testament sermon series. We're in week five. If you haven't started yet, that's okay. Go ahead and just start. That program works 40 days wherever you begin. Uh, if you want to jump in with us where we are, then by all means do that. And if you are tracking right along this coming week, you're going to get the privilege of exploring 1 Corinthians, which is where we're going to spend some time this morning. So if you have a Bible or you want to check us out on the Version Bible app, I hope that you're going to do that. So I want to introduce you to 1 Corinthians by just taking you back to a time in your life where maybe you read somebody else's mail. Now, I know you would never do that intentionally, right? Uh, maybe your sister or your brother got something in the mail when they were a kid or somebody wrote them a love note or whatever and you wanted to read it. Or maybe you snagged their diary when they weren't looking and you opened it up and you've read it when you weren't supposed to do it. You were reading something that was designed for somebody else, writing to somebody else. Okay, that is what you get when you read an epistle, you're literally reading somebody else's mail. So when we get to 1 Corinthians, we are reading the mail between Paul and the church at Corinth. Now, Corinth was an amazing place. It was this bustling metropolis. It was a port city. It, had, it was this great place of commerce. It was a prosperous crossroad on the peninsula. And so people, when they were trying to go from pieces of Asia to Italy with their commerce, they would almost always stop there in Corinth. It was filled with merchants and slaves and laborers, and, and it was just a place of vibrancy. There is an economic boom going on when 1 Corinthians is written, 
And so Corinth is this place, I want you to picture in your mind, it's like this hybrid, if you took a, turned into a salad, the cities of New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas, that is Corinth. So let me explain to you what I mean. There was a set of games, like you picture the Olympics, which go on every four years. Well, every two years, the second most popular games in the world were called the Isthmian Games. And they were similar to the Olympics and held there in Corinth. And they were so passionate about their sports that when the city was destroyed by a massive earthquake, guess what? They played anyway. So even as the city is lying flat in ruins, I guess they just picked up a rock or something and started playing baseball with it. They didn't stop playing the games just because the whole city had been destroyed. They kept playing anyway. The most influential office in that city was not mayor or something of Corinth. It was being the sponsor of the Isthmian Games. So again, Corinth, cosmopolitan, bustling, energetic, port city, big on sports, okay? So then you move from there to it being this great place of philosophy where it's a great place of leading thought. So lots of Roman cities had an Athenian past and so they became these really heady places where there was great philosophy and ideas being spread around. Now, Corinth was also at the same time known as the, well, we'll say sin city of its day. It was a highly, highly promiscuous city sexually. The Athenian playwright Aristophanes actually uses the term, when he wants to say fornication in his plays, he uses the term Corinthia Zestai. That's his way of saying, by just using the city's name and using it as a particular verb, that that's how evil it was. You did not want to be called, and you did not want your mom called, or your sister called, a Corinthian girl. In the ancient world, that was not a compliment, and it meant that they were promiscuous. So into that world we go. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see Paul begin writing to this church. Now keep in mind, again, you got a little New York, you got a little L.A., you got a little Vegas uh, in there. It's known as essentially the sin city of its time, but it's full of culture and philosophy and sports. It's just an electric place, but it's a crazy place. So the Apostle Paul goes in there, begins preaching, starts the church there at Corinth, and he gets a letter one day from somebody by the name of Chloe and her family. They send him this letter and they basically say, hey, look, Paul, you know, uh, you can take the church out of Corinth, but you can't take the Corinth out of the church. Uh, you know, you, the, the, the church is not just in the world as they ought to be. Now the world has gotten into the church in a very, very significant way. So Paul, after having left Corinth, now is starting to write back and saying to them, hey, listen, guys, I know things are wobbling bad right now. Here's how you set yourself right. And time and time again, he's going to do something very, very powerful. It seems so simple. And it, it's passed on to us today that when you're facing things going on in life, when you're facing things going on in the world around you that are starting to pull at you morally, ethically, in terms of your beliefs, you go back to the gospel. Now, 1 Corinthians, it's the core gospel that he's talking about. And he seems to think, Paul does, that there in the gospel are all the riches of the wisdom of God. So you don't look to philosophy, you don't look to sex, you don't look to alcohol, you don't look to your family, you don't look to any of those places as a source of where you actually go for wisdom, the place that you go to restore your soul, the place that you go when you've kind of fallen off the wagon of whatever wagon that might be, you go back to that place, that place where you remember that you laid your life down for the one who laid his life down for you, that there in the gospel, are the very riches of God. So the answer to almost any question I have can go back to the answers provided for me by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul writes to this electric city, to the church that's there in that city, who's struggling to learn the initial doctrines about Christianity. I mean, imagine being in that world, being raised that way culturally, and then all of a sudden, just like that, you're supposed to live very differently. You're supposed to change the way that you see the world from a I'm in a place full of temples and shrines filled with idols and promiscuity and prostitution and sports and all of this stuff. And now I'm just supposed to stop doing that and come back and, and then just change the way that I see the world. 
And then when they do, then they find they're still in this society that's pulling at them all the time, pointing fingers at them and ridiculing them and saying, you guys are crazy. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. What do you mean? What do you mean you can't do that anymore? What do you mean you're not going to worship idols anymore? What do you mean you're not just going to have flings with whoever you want to anymore? Why? Why not? And they have to then continue to say over and over and over again, because God has changed us. He's changed us by the power of the gospel. What's the gospel? And so Paul keeps anchoring them back and taking them back, reminding them of what the gospel is. So 1 Corinthians is this wonderful, wonderful letter written to people living in the city who are asking questions about all sorts of things, from how and what they ought to eat to how to be a church, how do I handle family life when I'm a Christian and my spouse isn't? Uh, what does a contemporary urban Christian family look like? Is there only one model or are there many models? How can I honor God as a single person when I have all these sexual desires? I don't know what to do. What do I do with somebody in the church who's sinning and impacting other people with their sin? And how do I keep the strength of God close at hand so that I don't give in to my impulses, that I can honor God in how I live, in what I do with my body and my mind and my money, all of that. So these are questions that may seem a little bit complicated, but 1 Corinthians are going, is going to say to us, they're answerable in God. They're answerable in the gospel. Paul will say that the core gospel, that Jesus Christ him crucified and raised is the foundation for living in today's world, in today's city particularly. For instance, at one point, Paul addresses the question of sexual choices, if you will, by saying, you are not your own, you were bought with a price, so glorify or honor God with your bodies. He's saying, taking them back to the gospel and saying, if you are in Jesus, your body no longer belongs to you, it's not your choice. If you follow Jesus, then your body follows him as well. But how? How do I do that? Well, that's what Paul takes the time to address in 1 Corinthians. The foolishness of the gospel, when people point their fingers and they ridicule and they make fun of them or whatever, Paul will say that the foolishness of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. Meaning, don't expect, don't hold your breath waiting for the world around you to understand why you're living the way you are. That path that you've chosen, don't expect it. It doesn't make sense to them. It, they just can't see it at this point in time. It's a little bit like they're on the field of dreams and they can't see the game being played yet. They just don't see it. So Paul goes to them and says, go back to the gospel. But, 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 that kind of still, there's still a problem there. Okay, even if the gospel, the atoning death of Jesus Christ for our sins, his, his resurrection, his empowerment of, of each one of us by the power of the Holy Spirit, what about the gravitational pull away of the quote-unquote civilized world in which they live around the church telling them that the God, or telling people telling the church that the gospel's craziness? I mean, if you say that the reason you know that the world is staying in orbit is because of gravity, and somebody comes along and proves that gravity's false, then all of a sudden the whole thing spins out on you, right? There's a core principle that guides the way that you live. What's being attacked in 1 Corinthians is the gospel itself as a way of living, as a way of doing life. And so what Paul's trying to do is to help them by helping them understand, listen, church, the wisdom of God is found in the foolishness of the gospel. That the foolishness of God, as they see it, is actually the greatest expression of his wisdom. And the unwillingness of the world to understand and, and to embrace it and to give their lives to it is not something that should surprise us. It's something that has often been the case and will remain the case to those who are perishing. We live in a rapidly changing world, just as they did. Change really is kind of the only constant there is, except for the gospel of Jesus. So to those of us who are trying to live out this faith of ours in today's world, we can easily, easily, easily get discouraged, or we can feel like people are making fools of us by thinking that the world is smarter, that they're more enlightened, that they're even more loving. People can say that and begin to take that on, that maybe they're less biased, or they're 
more loving than God or his people. And just as the Corinthians were influenced by philosophers that taught that in the square, every single day they were influenced, that square that they had now has come to us online. It comes to us through our television sets, in newspapers, in our music, on Netflix or Hulu or YouTube or wherever that square that preaches that counter gospel arrives into your life. So the good news that we're going to read here in just a moment is that God gives us all that we need in Jesus. So those who are perishing, though, think that the cross is ridiculous. If you would, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Listen to this. For the word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Get this. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. There's a verse you can underline in your Bible. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, what he's saying there is so amazingly powerful. What he's saying in essence is, God is so much wiser than we are, the one who gave us the gospel, that if he had, he doesn't, but if he had a dumbest day, he would still be smarter than we are on our best days. That if he had a weak day, where if he hadn't eaten in a few days or something like that, if he was totally famished and out of gas, he would still be stronger than we are at our strongest. That power of the gospel is something that to those who are perishing makes no sense at all. And to them, it seems like complete foolishness. But that's one of the great paradoxes of the gospel is in the simplicity of it, in the paradox of it, comes the very wisdom and the grandeur of God. So if you've had somebody tell you something before that maybe you just couldn't possibly believe, and you go, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. That's what's going on at Corinth. They look at it and they go, you mean to tell me that you decided that instead of the idols and the orgies and the, um, and the promiscuity and the worldliness and all of the stuff that is going on here at Corinth, that instead of that, you are going to go uh, follow a seemingly homeless, uneducated carpenter from Nazareth who was nailed to a cross by Rome, and um, that, that's the plan. And Paul says, it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. And so he takes them back to the cross, the victory at the empty tomb. Jesus the king, King Jesus now reigning over everything. And he tries to take them back there. But keep in mind, this foolishness that he's talking about, this was a very, very real thing. There's some first century graffiti, some inscriptions out there. They're equivalent of graffiti found in Rome depicting a crucified body with the head of a mule on it. And the caption on it is, Alexamenos worships his God. That's the kind of stuff that was being hurled at the people at Corinth. So, here we are. We're in the world we're in. People point at the church say, that didn't make any sense. That's ridiculous. They point at people who've been, in their mind, hypocritical. They look at that. That's ridiculous. That proves it's not true. That proves this. That proves this. As though there are no hypocrites outside the church. But they point at things. And they make fun. They mock. How can anybody believe that? Well, what Paul's going to say to them in 1 Corinthians is that Christ is the source of true knowledge. Some people might think that Christianity and intellect or, or, or whatever are supposed to be foes. 
But keep in mind who's writing these words. Paul was no intellectual slouch. He was a Pharisee, an expert in the Jewish scriptures. And we know from other places in scripture that he was quite the philosopher himself and go toe to toe with almost any, anybody. He's not attacking knowledge. He's attacking pompous, arrogant, intellectually empty worldliness, masquerading as true knowledge. Something that would look down at the humility of Jesus himself and mock and hurl insults. Well, there were people who did that when Jesus was being crucified, and he is where he is, and, and they are where they are. So what Paul's doing is taking them back to the wisdom of God that we see in what he's done for us in Jesus. Because there's a difference in utilizing human knowledge as a way of understanding God, for instance, which is what Paul would, you know, he's the one that told us that we're supposed to have the mind of Christ and to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's using knowledge to help us understand God, to understand the universe, versus using, trying to use human knowledge as something that's kind of trans-God, that's above God, better than or, or something else. And at Corinth, their problem was over-reliance on the wisdom of the world that said, you guys are crazy for believing that. And because they listened so closely to what society thought, what their equivalent of the newscasters or the media or whatever, the people on the street or whatever, because they listened to that so much, it was pulling them away. They were being led astray by it. So 1 Corinthians, perhaps more than almost anything, is, t is telling us that there is a different kind of wisdom. Okay? Wisdom of the world and wisdom of the gospel are not fundamentally always opposites, but they're not the same either. They are not the same. Sometimes what the world is going to advise us is going to be antithetical to the gospel itself. It'll be wrong. And so when we point it out, they're going to mock and they may disagree. And why would they do that? Because that's what those who are perishing do, Paul is going to say. So at Corinth, they're allowing human wisdom to transcend the wisdom of the cross in their lives as the guiding light from everything, uh, including what they eat, to their sexuality, to their family life, unity, perspectives on their bodies. Okay, all of that struggle continues today, right now, in your life and in mine. That struggle hasn't stopped. There are always going to be mockers, as long as there's a gospel and as long as there's a world. There will always be mockers. But we need to remember these words of Paul that God's foolishness is greater than the wisdom of men. God's weakness is stronger than the strength of men. That he's just smarter. He's just wiser. He's just stronger. The church at Corinth was so used to relying on the philosophers of their own day, they were continuing to allow uh, what they had heard or what those philosophers were saying completely and utterly shake their faith and begin to alter their obedience to Jesus. Paul wants them to know that human knowledge at its best provides us with knowledge of God, but because its source is Christ, human knowledge, or isn't Christ, human knowledge is limited in its foolishness compared with the wisdom of Christ. If, in fact, God actually chooses the weak to shame the strong and the foolish to shame the wise, which is what he says in 1 Corinthians, then we shouldn't be surprised if there's a disconnect between those two worlds. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31, he continues, and he says, For consider your calling, brothers. He, you can hear him imploring them. He's begging them. He's saying, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But get this. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak. He chose it. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being, if you want to underline something, you can try that one on right there, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written let the one who boasts boast in the lord he's saying god intentionally 
chooses things that are unimpressive, illogical, miraculous, to shame the wise, to humble those who think they're so brilliant. I had a professor once who used to use the term epistemic humility. Epistemology is the study of how we know what we know. And he would talk to us about making sure that no matter how much we think we know, we remember that we don't know everything and that there's always a chance we could be wrong, that there's a humility that goes with this that is clearly lacking in Corinth. And what he's trying to highlight to them is, yes, I know that to them it looks unimpressive, but God chose that. He intentionally chose that. And if you look over the, the whole arc of the Bible, Jesus is God's way of demonstrating his wisdom and our foolishness. I mean, think about whether it's the nation of Israel who he calls to be his own chosen people. And he says to them, I'm choosing you because you are so unimpressive. That's literally what he says. It's not the kind of label I'd want, but that's what he says. I'm choosing you because you are absolutely unequivocally unimpressive. When it comes time for him to raise up Samuel, he chooses Hannah, a barren woman. When it's time to fight Goliath, he chooses David, a shepherd boy, while King Saul is cowering over in the corner. When it comes time for his son to be born, he chooses Mary. When Jesus enters the world, he comes as a carpenter from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? He chose it that way. And yes, he chooses this ragamuffin band of people called by the gospel that he calls the church. So if people look and say, how unimpressive is that? That might just be what he chose. And they don't understand that it's there in that mustard seed, as Jesus would talk about, that the mustard seed, while it looks unimpressive at the time, will become the largest, biggest, baddest in the garden. And that group that was there, that started at Pentecost, and now we read about in Corinth, becomes the church now against which hell will not prevail. Why did he do it that way? Why didn't he give us all the fancy stuff that would let people know, hey, look how great they are, because they would say how great they are instead of how great God is. That we have this hunger for spotlight. We have the hunger for security found in the things of the world and the wisdom of man rather than in the wisdom of God. So God, in all of his wisdom, knew better. And he gives us instead of his son who rides in the way they thought he would in great victory with the big robe and the big crown and all the armies of the world. Instead, he enters the world in a manger. And instead of leaving the world with a triumphal procession, he leaves on a cross. But he doesn't stay there. He doesn't stay there. He goes from there. He rises from the grave. He walks among his, his followers and witnesses, and he equips them to live the same life that he lived. Why? Because God chose it that way. That's what God wanted. And in that humbleness, in that humility, lies the victory of the gospel. There was a woman, we always try to doctor paintings up of Jesus. One woman, it went terribly wrong. So this is the painting she was given. Now look at how pitiful this is. Uh, <laughs> she tried to touch this picture up. So she was supposed to improve this. And so she put her hand to it and she ended up with, with, with this, which looks a little bit like, a, I don't know, uh, like a Oreo cookie with a peanut butter middle that somebody kind of like pulled the, the lid off and has been playing around with the peanut butter. I mean, it's a, it's a horrible version of a painting. But it happens when you have people who don't know what they're doing, trying to make Jesus look better. You see where I might go with this? That typically when you feel like, oh, Jesus doesn't look the way he's supposed to, he looks a little shabby, let's try and touch him up, let's make him a little bit more palatable, let's make him a little bit smarter, let's make him a little bit more this, let's try and play the world's game. We take him from this to this. When in reality, what God wants is for us to take him from this and restore him as he is. And who's that? The humble king. The sacrifice, 
the, the sacrificial servant, the suffering servant of God, who has now been glorified and sits at the right hand of God. But before we follow him and we get the crown, there remains the cross. And in our day, here in San Diego County and beyond, wherever it is that you're living, you're going to face the same things. You're going to face the same types of things. People are going to look from time to time, at least if you're living the Christian faith the way it's supposed to be, they're going to look at you and think you're foolish. They're going to look and say, that doesn't make any sense. I can't believe you would believe that. I can't believe you're doing that. I can't believe you're giving your life to that. And at the same time, I hope you hear these words of Paul. God shows that way in his wisdom. In his wisdom. And when the time is right, the victory will be ours. We're going to be gathering around the Lord's table now. And we're going to do it this morning as people on a pilgrimage, similar to the people at Corinth. And you may be like them. You may be in a spot where you're starting in the back of your mind to go, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, because you've heard the world chiming into your ear a lot. That's crazy. That didn't make any sense. You know, if there was a God, why is this and that and this? All those kinds of things. Today, based on what we've read, I want to encourage you to stand firm, plant your feet, and embrace the wisdom of God, which will look a little bit different than the wisdom over here. But to trust in his wisdom, the one who gave us his son as the ultimate expression of his wisdom. And don't expect, don't hold your breath waiting for the world to understand or the world to get it. Because to those who are perishing, it makes no sense at all. But to those of us who have been given the gift of eternal life, it doesn't just make sense. It is the very power of God at work in us and among us as his people. So it's to him we now turn as we gather around the table. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, now as we take the bread and the cup, we invite you to join us here, Father, and we, we, we thank you for the wisdom that you have shown us in Christ. Father, today we say, just as Paul would say to, to the church at Corinth, Father, that even among us uh, the, who are wavering, those of us who are being blown around a little bit or getting insecure in our faith or feeling a little bit uh, or giving in to desires that maybe we shouldn't, Father, I ask that today you restore, that you strengthen, that you convict our hearts again, Father, so that we can walk boldly in the time we're living in. And that we can stop relying on the, <laughs> the back padding of the society in which we live and instead, Father, live for your approval and your applause. So, Father, strengthen us today. Help us to understand that your, your foolishness is wiser than our greatest wisdom. And your strength is so much greater that your weakness <laughs> is stronger than our greatest strength. So, Father, now for what you've revealed to us in Jesus, we give you thanks and we honor you today in his name. Amen.
You don't know 